As far as we are concerned, we have a view that this pandemic, based on our nominal R calculation, okay. is actually, at best, moving exponentially as we predicted or has slightly accelerated. Mm. If it's any of them too, that is a big concern. The government says we are going after the virus. Most people have doubted this. What parameters do we usually would have to look at before we clear this doubt or accept government's assertion that it is going after the virus? Well, Johnny, you see, I have said to most of people that when it comes to epidemics, it's not about rhetoric. It's at, at its heart. It's a mathematical, or I call it arithmetics. Mm. It's the, the, the hard facts of contact tracing, treatment, mm. management, mm. identification of the pathogen testing are mm. sciences. But once you've got the data, you're dealing with mathematics and statistics. Right. Basically, that's it. Okay. And so you need to have mathematical parameters. And I'll enumerate some of them that you have to have. I've said one already, which is the reproductive number. Absolutely. With, um, the number of people who get infected by mm. a known infected person. So the second generation of infections. Okay. Then there's what we call the generational time, which is the time it takes for the first infected person to infect the second one. Mm. For something like... Uh, the coronavirus, the novel okay. coronavirus, is mm. 1.5 days. So that's another thing. And then there's a doubling time, which is the time it takes for your case count to double. So if you had two people infected today, how long is it going to take them to get to four? Mm. How long is it take, going to take four to get to eight? Right. Eight to get to six. Okay. So these are parameters that you need to consistently mm. keep your eye on because that is what gives you an understanding of whether you are controlling the virus ahead of it or behind. Are you seeing us tracking it right? Are you seeing us yes. tracking it right in terms of, uh, for example, the, the picking of samples, testing, and reporting the results as it were on the website and telling the Ghanaian public what is? Well, you see, Johnny, like I said, I, I like doing these things mathematically. So let's take a look at the... Um, what do you call it? incidents that happened in a fish factory in Tema. Right. Where it is alleged that one person infected 533 people. That's right. I would put it differently. One person didn't infect 533 people. What is the one case? Person, one person accounted for 533 infections. And I use that reproductive number to uh, explain it. So the, uh, one person infects three people, right? Okay. So one person would infect three. Three would infect nine because mm -hmm. that's three times three. Right. Nine would infect 27, okay. which is nine times three. 27 would infect um, eight one. Mm -hmm. Eight one would then infect 243. So right. that is how it works. Okay, In multiples so of three. If you look, yes, if you look at it, because it is alleged that it took about nine days between the index case being sampled, and the mm. results coming, confirming that they were positive. And the generational time being 1.5 days, we're talking about six generations right. of three. So one plus three plus nine plus 27 plus 81 plus 224 plus 720. So that is the number of infections that would have happened in that period of okay. time. Well, More importantly, okay, right. you're also looking at the probability that these interactions would actually lead to an infection. So. And that's why you, when there's contact tracing, mm. you can then go and sample the contacts and you realize that not everyone has tested positive right. because it depends on the extent of interaction mm -hmm. and the probability of these interactions ultimately leading to an infection. Okay. What accounts for these? Tell me. The extent is they were working in the same workplace, so they are interacting frequently. Right. The probability depends on how close and that's why we talk of social distance okay so how close they were how densely populated this work environment is mm. were they traveling on staff buses and stuff like that so when i look at it from that point of view and i see 533 when i know the number could have been over six generations over a thousand mm. i know that 
the interactions might have been less sparse and the probability might have been decreased. So albeit the 533 being a huge number, in the scheme of things, it's actually not. Okay. And but, these are the things I'm looking at. And okay. I'm saying that we need not be alarmist about some of these parameters, but okay. rather look at it from the mathematical standpoint and ask ourselves, what can we do to mitigate against these things? The, the incubation uh, stages or uh, rate keeps changing. People are skeptical, the Ghanaian public, especially given the fact that they are not getting a lot of education in their local dialects. Question, have you been satisfied with the level of education given to the Ghanaian people about this pandemic? Well, Johnny, anyone who goes into public office or goes into leadership goes in electively. That is, you elect to serve. And by electing to serve, you have a good understanding of the people you are electing to serve. Now, we have a situation where we see the level of apathy and despondency about people. I mean, we've seen it in a where, mm. um, in a Kropon where a chief was installed. We right. saw it in the Ga area where mm -hmm. Ga was installed. You mm -hmm. see people and you see the level of interaction. You see the lackadaisical approach to wearing of face masks. You see the likes of Bukum Banku giving an interview and going that, well, when it was going on in countries like Italy and in Spain, we could see mm. footage, we could see stories, we could see case counts, we could see things that convinced us that this virus was devastating. It's come to Ghana and we cannot see anything. That's instructive. Right. So even if you, if you want to convince me that, oh, we've been trying with education, the end user of that information is not actually benefiting from the information and not behaving in a manner that is cognizant of fighting this pandemic. But, but, so WHO, case, but, but WHO has listed us as one of the top six countries, six top countries that are doing very well in managing this pandemic. Uh, is the WHO treating us with kids' gloves? Johnny, could you provide a document to back what you're saying? But that's what These government is telling us. Well, so, so sometimes I like to be very, very particular and pedantic when it comes to documentation. If docu WHO issues a pronouncement to that effect, you can find a document on their website, can't you? Right. Or you can contact the, the country officials of the World Health Organization and they'll give you a document to that effect. The, as far as I'm concerned, mm. and having tracked this, there is no such document. <laughs> I have seen a newspaper report from Ghana, right, referring that to the WHO. So I cannot speak to that set of information because I don't even trust that that information is credible. You tell me, uh, for example, our, our recovery rate is looking very good. Mortality rate uh, is commendable, 0 0.52 now. Uh, well, with the new figures, it may change, but I'm using the, the previous figures because our recovery rate now is 8.86 and is among the lowest in Africa, 3.52. What does this mean for the infected and those who are yet to be infected by the multiplication table that you use, 3 by 3, 9, 9 by 9, 27, and on? What does this mean? You see, Johnny, we are dealing with a disease or a pathogen that is very crafty. At its little best, it kills the elder people with comorbid states. Mm. It can make you feel very ill and unwell, even when you are quite healthy and have no comorbid states and you are young. At its slowest best, it is known to leave what's called a chronic disease bed. Mm. And what do I mean by a chronic disease bed? It is known that people who are infected either mildly or moderately who do not fall that ill might be left with um, issues to do with their lungs, like fibrosis, issues to do with their liver, issues to do with their heart, and issues to do with their kidney. Okay. Which then leaves them with what we call a chronic disease hangover. Okay. Meaning that for the rest of your life, you would have to manage these um, diseases that you've inherited by the fact that you got infected. Mm. For some of them, especially the asymptomatic ones, they might not even know until later that they got infected with the coronavirus, and these chronic diseases would come later on in life. These are going to impact on healthcare delivery in our country. They are going to impact on the quality of life of citizens. So 
how do I look at them, our recovery rate? If I look at our recovery rate and I look at Africa, the recovery rate being around 35.2% compared with our 8.6% that mm. you quoted. And I look at today's press conference okay. where the director of the Ghana Health Service said that it is partly because we actually do two negative tests mm. to pronounce people as having recovered that right. case count is low. And actually quotes the 130 Mm. people are on the waiting list who, if they tested positive at second time, even if I added 130 to the 494, still it only brings our recovery rate to 12.2%, which is still about 23% less than what is happening in okay. Africa and mm. globally. So then we realize that there is a shortfall. Right. What does that mean? So that means that, means that mm -hmm. our active case count, which is the difference between a uh, number of people who've actually got infected, mm -hmm. number of people who have recovered, and mm -hmm. number of people who unfortunately have passed away, right. keeps growing because people are not recovering early and people are testing positive and joining on a daily basis. Okay. That then gives us a problem when it comes to the number of bed occupancy and how we're going to isolate these people. Because okay. maybe you were dealing with 2,000 people. Now you're dealing with 4,600. Tomorrow right. you might be dealing with close to 5,000. Okay. The, the, and this puts a problem on our health system based on infrastructural as well as human resources. So it is not a pretty situation to look at. Okay. Kwame, hold your horses. We'll take a quick break here. This is Hot Issues live on TV3. When we return, we'll keep our conversation up with Kwame. Uh, the concluding part, we'll look at the epidemiological curve, whether we have peaked or not what implications it will have on our health system, whether we have the capacity to sustain the fight, given the growing numbers and all of it. The underlying question is, are we being told the truth or not? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Hot Issues. Tonight, we're asking a question whether or not we're being told the truth in the fight against COVID-19. My guest via Zoom is Kwame Sapuensidu, who is a practicing pharmacist, a public health expert, and also a research fellow with the Center for Democratic Development, CDD Ghana. Kwame, welcome back from the break. Quickly, let's look at the implications of all the things you have told me. I'm scared at this point, uh, but I'm, I'm told to keep calm and not spread fear. What are the implications on me, the average Ghanaian, who was advised by the president last Sunday to eat contumery and all of that, the health system itself? Do we have the capacity from where you sit? You see, Johnny, I've always had a problem with that communication strategy of spread calm. And I have said it a number of times. And why do I say so? The human being is modulated by four sets of hormones. There's dopamine, there's serotonin, there's adrenaline and there's oxytocin. Every hormone has a role to play. Mm. Oxytocin is a hormone for love. Dopamine is a hormone for reward. Serotonin is a hormone for mood. And adrenaline is a hormone for fright, flight, or fear. Okay. When you are in a war, you trigger the adrenaline reflexes. This is a war. Okay. If you talk about calm, you are triggering serotonin and oxytocin. So therefore, when things start going pear-shaped, it gets difficult to get people to react. So sometimes when I see the behaviors that we see on our streets, mm. where people think it's business as usual, I am not surprised because I know that the hormone modulating their behavior mimics exactly how they are behaving. Mm. There is no sense of urgency. But the truth of the matter is a month ago, today, we have right. 566 cases. Right. Today, we have 5,127, almost 10 times more in four weeks. Mm. So if under those circumstances, you tell me to stay calm with a pathogen as virulent mischievous and crafty as the coronavirus 2019 are there to differ what, what, because as as it stands now johnny we don't even know the full scope and span of the disease burden that we're going to be saddled 
we are making it up as we go along. The research is telling us. Mm. I mean, look at it from the point that a few weeks ago, even the WHO said don't wear face masks because right. it didn't mitigate against the spread. Okay. Now we know you have to. A few weeks ago, we thought this was a classic respiratory disease. Mm. Now we know it causes multiple organ shock. We know it causes cytokine storm. We know it interferes with the clotting of your blood. We know it can shut down your kidney and your liver. We know that it can leave you with res um, serious respiratory distress. It can leave you with liver failure. It can leave you in a state where you need, um, what do you call it, um, dialysis for the rest mm. of your life. So we are not dealing with a pathogen that understands the word calm. And naturally, Ghanaians are difficult people. Okay. Calm is not a communication strategy for us. Mm. What's a strategy for us? You need to communicate to us candidly mm. and vividly with as much information as possible tailored to our understanding. That is where the whole issue of communicating in the native languages comes into play. Okay. Because look at it from this point. We have a situation now where the actual contacts test positive for COVID less than enhanced surveillance. I'm sure you've seen the data on the panel health. Right. Test. Enhanced testing, routine testing, contact tracing, yes. all of that. Yes. The mm. contact tracing is a biased population, what we call a biased core statistically. Okay. Because they've come into contact with a known infected person, so they should most likely mm. test positive. Okay. However, the general population are testing positive more, which means that streets are not safe mm. from the uh, probability point of Which view. means there's a lot more community spread. Thank you very much. And the, and the data shows it. At the moment, we almost um, we started from about 1.04 people per every 100 samples. Now we are about 4% per every 100 samples. Government, so government says that's because we are testing more. And on the continent of Africa, if you pick every million, we are testing more ratios than many other African countries. Johnny, that's true. But it's also true that if, the, if the, a disease is not in your country, you can test your entire population and you not find a single sample. Okay. That you are testing more and finding more means the disease is spreading. As much as it means that you are finding more and it gives you the ability to manage the situation because you are testing more. But then, if you realize your percentage of positive tests increasing from 1.04, to 1.45, to 1.50, to 1.83, to 1.85, to mm. 2.01, to 2.18. And now we are 3.45. You have almost a 300% increase. Yes, you are finding it more, but it's also true that, yes, the disease is spreading. In your what, what are your thoughts about our epidemiological curve? Have we peaked? Have we not? That's the conversation now. A few days ago, oh, I the, heard... As for, as, for, as for the peaking, it was a myth. And I did speak to that considerably it's one of the biggest myths i've found spoken or ever spoken backed by science point, and data well whatever it was it was a myth because the bottom line is the curve is a polynomial curve meaning that there are multiple factors contributing mm. to the spread of the disease in Epi um, what do you call epidemiological terms? You talk about assortative and disassortative spread and mixed spread going on. There's mm. a multiple things going on. We don't have the time to unpick all of them, but there's a lot of things going on. Ideally, our care needs to come to a binomial where mm. you have only two factors and then you start controlling it and then our R starts um, trending towards one. Are we, far from, are we far from that curve being flattened? No, we are nowhere near it. I mean, we, we are not, we are not. The point is, as a, as a journalist, mm. do you even know what Ghana's, um, what do you call it, effective R or nominal R is? You don't know. Mm. So if you don't know that, if the um, official don't, cannot put that information out and we cannot start working towards it, we are nowhere near flattening. Okay? I mean, anytime you look at the cave, if you just want to look at it, you don't even need to plot it. Mm. Go on Worldometer and click on that and look at the curve and look at how the curve is spiking and ask yourself, does this look like anything near flat? Kwame, if you met the managers of the pandemic in Ghana today, top three things that you tell them to do right to make sure that we are all safe 
and secure from all alarm. Communicate candidly is the first thing. Mm. Communicate candidly and communicate to the understanding of the citizen. Make sure the data around tracking is act so civil society, the press can independently interrogate these numbers and hold your feet to the fire because it makes you better. Mm. And then finally, don't try and stifle contributions from diverse sources. Because at the end of the day, we're fighting a pathogen, not each other. Are we being told the truth? That's my final question to you. John, I wouldn't really say um, we, are, or we are not being told the truth. I'm more interested in what we are not being told. I've said so many times that I come to these conversations and debates knowing that it would be naive to say that the government is not doing anything, but asking myself, could we have done more? And the honest answer from where I sit and what I'm looking at is yes, a lot more. So it's rather what we are not being told that I'm concerned about, rather than whether or not we are being told the truth. I was looking for a yes or no yeah. answer, but since you're not giving me, what would be your rating no, of I'll government? Of not, of, what, what, would, what would be your rating? Since I'm not getting that yes or no, what would be your rating of government's performance in managing this pandemic in your homeland, Ghana? I would say just over 50%, 60%. They have done it uh, quite a bit, but there's a lot more that can be done. Okay, Kwame, thank you very much indeed for your time. And we've been exploring what we're doing, what we're not doing, and what we could do better, and whether or not we're being told the truth or not regarding our fight against the novel coronavirus, COVID-19. My name is Johnny Hughes. Many thanks to my guest via Zoom, Kwame Sapoisiru. He is a practicing pharmacist, a public health uh, expert, and also a research fellow with a CDD here in Ghana. Martin Esiri, that is up next with News at 10. Many thanks to Grandpa for my outfit to come back to my producer and the rest of the team. Have a good night.